here talking about breast cancer, shining a light on it, shining a light on overall health. And I don't know if everyone knows that you call it a dual citizenship. Um, can you just share what it was like? So I remember hearing uh, that you had been diagnosed with breast cancer yeah. and thinking, really? This woman who has devoted her entire life to helping people, what was that like for you? Well, first, before I answer that, I just want to thank you because uh, for your sharing your story, people see you, they love you, they respect you, and the fact that you're sharing your story gives them the confidence and makes them, makes them feel not alone. And, uh, and you've been, it's been hugely therapeutic to a lot of people, and it was a gift that you've given, and so I want to thank you for that. And, uh, you know, just because I'm a breast oncologist and I've been in the field for just over 30 years now, did not give me a free pass, you know. Uh, that breast cancer is the most common cancer to affect women. 30, 29%, or basically 30% of all cancers in women start in the breast. You know, it happens to be the favorite place for cancer to start in a woman's body. And only 10% of breast cancers are due to one of those single genes that produces a high risk, like what Angelina has. 90% um, are due mostly to how you lead your everyday life. So I didn't expect to be, you know, to get a free pass. I knew I was at risk like anybody else. And I went for my mammogram at Bainline Health at Lankanau, and I got the call, you know, that call from the, the, the doctor saying that, uh, they see something they're concerned about. They needs to be checked out further, and so that made me that, that one thing led to another, and uh, I became the dual citizen, the the doctor and the patient. And I can say that I'm lucky to have received the best care possible, and I also know that you know you see your doctors intermittently, and you do the best you can. But in your everyday life, you're trying to make the best choices, what you eat, what you drink, what you breathe in, the medicines you take, personal products you use. What do you tell your daughter? What do you tell your sister? You know, what can you be doing in your everyday to stay as healthy as possible? Right, and that's the great thing I think about your message is that there's so much all of us can be doing. So when I say all of us, Anyone in the room who has not had breast cancer so that you can reduce your chances of getting it. For those of us in the room who have had breast cancer, so we can reduce our risk of it coming back. And for those who are living with it, mm -hmm. to be able to live with it. Put in remission. Put it in remission, right. And so there's lots of things that people can do because you made the point that only 10%, right? Only 10% is hereditary. The rest has to do with our environment, and you're fond of saying, like, how the inside and the outside environments interact. That's right. You know, you have to think of your body as like an environment. And because people always think about the outside environment, the trees, the ocean, the, all that. But really, inside your body is a very special place. And anytime you take something from the outside in, it can affect how your cells are built and run. So you have to look at what you're eating, what you're drinking, what you're breathing in, as, you know, what goes in, on, and around you, and decide, am I, gonna, I, am I gonna let this in or not? Is it helpful, harmful, or harmless? And it's not just food, and not just medicines, it's not just personal care products, it's also emotional things, too. Like, I'm sure a lot of you in your, in your very demanding lives between home, work, and in the environment, know people or situations that make you feel good and powerful and inspired. But there are other people and situations that may bring you down. So the question is, how do you keep that outside and the outside environment and don't let it sort of come in and sort of pollute how you're feeling and thinking and that which you can accomplish? I was wondering, Jordan, if you could um, put on um, a slide. I. With my own, I was going to just share that, you know, when I went through my own experience and I knew the hard work I would have to go through in order to feel like I could get over the treatment and get me back my life that was worth living, and, and the treatments are, are demanding, you know, they have side effects and all. So I needed to be mindful of, you know, of the blessings in my life and what, was, what made life worth living and to motivate me to do the hard work in the everyday to be healthy. 
And it's not just true for me as a breast cancer survivor now, but it's true for anybody who's in this room who wants to be healthy. And I, can, I, I de developed a tool called the Full Life View, which is that everyone wants a full life full of wonderful things. And the Full Life View starts where you are now. Because the past is history, and all we really have is the present, and the future is just a promise for everybody. But you can take some very meaningful steps in your everyday to hope for and plan for a full life. And so I'm just sharing my, my friend and colleague, uh, Rita, who's with me today. Um, you know, I met her at Lankanau, and um, she helped me develop the Full Life View. And the Full Life View starts, I use it as a tool of my patients. So I first ask, you know, ask the patient, you know, how can, I, how can I be most helpful to you today? And tell me about your life and what you, what you dream about, what, you want to, what you're looking forward to, what is on your calendar, what do you, what's, what are your, do you plan trips? I mean, are there, do you have graduations, weddings, children's, your grandchildren? What, are you, what makes your life rich, blessed, and wonderful? And so that's how we start our meeting, and I develop the full life view, and I say, okay, you're 46 now. Let's talk about getting you to 90. And then when you get to 90, we'll talk 120. And then when people laugh at that moment, it's, it is a great, this, what it does, it's very therapeutic because it right away tells the person, you have a chance for a full life. And it also, the laughter, just the connection, it makes them feel like you care about them and you're really looking out for them in the long term. And when, you, when people come to see a doctor, they're usually nervous and worried. So when you get them to relax and laugh a little bit, it allows them to be more, um, better able to listen, understand, remember what I say, and be more engaged. And the fact is, and if I could have the next, um, so, you know, the next part, so in the full life view, you sort of add in, you know, talk about their family, work, the, what's meaningful to them, and so make the, make the full life view look like their life so they can relate to it like it's their own story. Next. And then for, for the people I take care of in the hospital, but really true for everyone in this room, what gets you from 46 to 90 is getting to and sticking to a healthy weight, exercising regularly, um, stop smoking, uh, take care of your other medical concerns, um, limit alcohol. We won't talk so much. I know we all, that's a controversial thing, right? <laughs> Sharing your life, you know, that, that to find ways to connect with other people. You know, if you're living alone, find ways to get out and about and reconnect with other people because social isolation is just as dangerous as smoking or being overweight. And then finding, you know, things that inspire you, like it could be meditation, it could be your faith. And so combining all these things, and the fact is at 90, you can say, we'll get you to 90, but the truth is if we don't take care of our everyday, and that 90 is just a promise, but it might be more like 65 that we're realistically shooting for and, that, 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 and working together. So this becomes a framework for a conversation that you uh, and anybody can have with their doctor. And you can bring it in with your do to your doctor's visit and say, here's where I am now on my full life view. You know? um, and for me, knowing that I had grandchildren, we're hoping for grandchildren, I don't have any yet. My kids aren't with the significant others yet. Well, I'm working on it. <laughs> but that gives me the willpower and the determination to stick with the medicines and the things that I have to take for a full life view. But I know each one of you around the room um, has the chance for a full life. And it's, in the every, it's the work that we have to do to get there is in our everyday. In, in our everyday. And so my message that I started to sort of shout from the mountaintops was don't wait because I caught mine early and then I said, well, the don't wait is not just about don't wait to do a self-exam. It's not just about make sure you go get a mammogram. It's about both. But it's also about don't wait to take care of these things in your life if you want the full life view. So, so now you're getting the opportunity to hear Dr. Weiss talk about this that, that the people who come into your office get to, get to hear about. But I say start now, don't wait. Because what we're doing in the everyday, as you're saying, will impact our, all, of that, all of those days, all of those years leading up to 90. So whatever it is, and, I, and I'm hoping, because um, Dr. Weiss has great information in terms 
of prevention in terms of reducing our risk, even if you set breast cancer aside for a second, in terms of just living a healthy life, living a healthy life till 90, I hope that you're able to take something, something concrete home from today and don't wait, start doing it or not doing it. You know, one of the things that was helpful to me and I find it's helpful to people that I have the honor of taking care of is to sort of get real about, you know, um, what the work that's involved with doing the everyday. You know, we're just people, we're human. And, you know, we, we don't always do what we're supposed to do. And it's a, we can struggle inside ourselves. I mean, uh, this, I, I know we're among women and, and very select men who are very enlightened today. But I know all of us have, a friend, as a friend of mine says, we all have like a, it's called an itty bitty shitty committee in our head. <laughs> that's saying, eat that, don't eat that, let's do this, let's, and the same, one where the people on the committee will say, eat it, and the other next to me, they'll say, don't eat it. It's like, what am I, you know, so when I was diagnosed, you know, people say that you, 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 you come up against a significant medical problem, it's a wake up call and it really forces you to get your act together, right? And get real about it. So I've always struggled with my weight and I, had, and I did end up losing a significant amount of weight after my diagnosis because I was pretty scared. Um, but one of the things that helped me was a friend of mine said, who's a doctor, said um, that when it comes to your weight management and going out to get exercise, it's no longer optional, it's now mandatory. So you have to change that conversation in your head. This is, it's no longer optional, should I go out and go to the exercise class? Should I not buy that food and bring it into the house because I'm gonna eat the whole bag tonight? Is, those are no longer optional choices. They become mandatory. If you want a chance at a full life view, to really have your full life, that the gift that you have in front of you, that is you, that you are your gift to yourself and your family, you have to take care of yourself. You know, the, the, we have so many great advances in medicine today and all these technologies that put things at your fingertips. But there's still, but still you are in charge of your health. You know, you have to find your voice and protect it. So just that shift in your thinking, it's mandatory, it's no longer optional, is helpful. And so exercise, it's, yes, mandatory. And then food as medicine or food knowing how it's nutritious to your body just thinking about that and believe me I'm not saying that I am a completely clean eater but I think differently now too with everything I choose is this really good for me because I want something that's really good for me because I want to be fueled I want nutrition in my body right absolutely and the fact is is that when it comes to weight management weight management ends up being the most important single thing you can do to have your best shot at living a full life do you know that 80% of weight management is what you eat and 20% is exercise? And that was something I had to get real about because I, you hear diet, exercise, diet, and exercise, it sounds like it's 50-50 when really it's 80% what you eat and 20% exercise in terms of how much weight you, how much you weigh. But the exercise ends up being the most important strategy to keep you on task. You, that's not just because you can't really eat so easily on the treadmill. Or in the Zumba class, it's hard to have like potato chips and more popcorn and chocolate. That helps, that helps, but it ends up being very useful. And in terms of, of food as medicine, just to say one more thing about that, because you know, you are what you eat, and the best type of food is going to be real food that's mostly plant based, really looking beyond the apple and the broccoli, but all kinds of fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, seeds, spices and really uh, you know, try to get those foods of all different colors because each color delivers you nutrients that your body is made of and that operates the body. It is also true though that food is, the med is another kind, it's like a drug for a lot of us. We know that, that it's like crack. I mean, it's, I mean there, you can't resist it, it's self-medication. So I think one of the things we have to do about getting real with our everyday, I call it the everyday, you know, because it's every day that we have to do the work to take care of ourselves. Is that we, we take care of our anxiety with food. You know, we, we, you know women are drinking, women and, and girls are drinking, more of us are drinking alcohol, we're drinking more of it. That puts a lot, that's got a lot of calories. And those, are, we use it because of self-medication. You know, we're relaxed at the end of the day to reward ourselves. 
um, we're upset about something, we want to have, be, have fun with somebody, you know, whatever. It's so much a part of everything. And one of the things that's true is that, you know, we, that's one of those things we really need to be mindful of as people growing older, that um, it has a lot of calories, it alters how we function, um, it's fun to, to have when you really want it and need it, and, and it, it's, mo you know, it, it, save your rations for when you want it the most. Um, but just know that alcohol does increase the risk of breast cancer and other issues. And even a few drinks, like if you stick to three or fewer drinks per week, you'll get the cardiovascular benefit, and, it does, and you'll be within the safe zone relative to breast cancer. So you mentioned some of us go to alcohol for stress reduction. That's another big piece of it is our sort of emotional health. It's all mind, body, spirit, and you have to address all of it if you really want to get to 90, live a healthy life, and reduce your risk of breast cancer. So, and there's all kinds of ways that you can do that. Meditation, yoga, whatever your spiritual tradition is. Right, and your mind is your, your most powerful organ. And if it's not working for you, then you got to work on it. And uh, you know, even for the weight management, just as an example about mindfulness, you know, if you eat really quickly, you didn't, you miss the opportunity to enjoy what you eat. But if you actually slowed down and you would actually eat less, and you, if you paid attention to what you're doing, you might enjoy that which you're eating more. So. One of, the, one of the things that I think is true for everyone in this room, for sure, women on the move, is that we're multitaskers, right? We're just constantly doing a million things at once, and it's amazing, amazing how many things we get done in one day. I, I, I know some of you, but if I had a conversation with each one of you and the enlightened men who are here today, I would be amazed by how much you get done in one, in one day. I mean, I'd be, it would blow me away, I know. And I would hopefully learn how to do your multitasking skills so I can do it better. But there are certain things that you shouldn't multitask on, okay? One is there's a safety issue. You know, you shouldn't be walking, talking, on the cell phone, driving in a car. You shouldn't do that. We're too old for that. No one should do that. That puts you at danger, okay? If, if I'm at this dinner table and my husband's there and my cell phone goes off and I look down at it, I see the look on his face. I know I shouldn't be multitasking. When he's talking to me, I need to give him my full attention. Now sometimes when I give, I give him some extra attention, he'll say, he'll say, he comes home from work and he'll say, um, so the manager, you know, should know, what did the manager say? I, I give him so, responsive yeah. listening and it's like way too, way too much attention. <laughs> But then I get the conversation over faster and I go back to other things I wanted to do. <laughs> it's a trick. Try it. The, the deal on that is w Tracy and I, you know, we need to learn from you too. Well, we'll get to questions in a second, but, but there, you know, really be careful about when you multitask and when you don't. Like you shouldn't be doing a million things, turn the oven on and go upstairs and do something <laughs> yeah. upstairs. You're going to set the house on fire, okay? And back to your mindfulness point, when you know I live my life saying it's not the situation or the person or what's happening is good or bad, it's the lenses that I put on to see it, which really, boy, was I challenged when you get the phone call from the doctor who says it's cancer. Um, then I thought, do you really, are you really gonna do that? And I, and I was able to do it, but, but it's, it's a daily thing. Talk about making daily choices, right, to live a, a life. Um, through that period, and, and even more so now, no matter what's happening in the crazy, you know, newsroom, it's how I choose to take it in. Right. Um, and I'm, and it's not because I want to live healthy, not because because you can you can get into the sort of the spiral of, oh my gosh, I don't want the cancer to come back. Oh my gosh, I got to do everything right. Oh my gosh, I don't want stress to come in, or I'm not going to drink a glass of wine, or mm, that's just that's that's just the negative. I only want the positive, so I try to take in the positive. Right. I mean, I think that you know, I, I don't have enough. I don't have enough time in the day to meditate, and I. That's one of the things that's on my list that I need to learn how to do. But I try to take at least a moment um, and uh, think. You know, think about a few things each day. First of all, I'm very grateful. I'm a very. I, I'm very lucky. Um, not just to have my health now, but to have the great people I work with to work at Mainline Health and to work at breastcancer.org and have great people. So I have a great family, and so I feel very blessed 
So when I wake up, I feel grateful to be alive. And then I say to myself, I'm going to do the best I can today to take care of myself. And it's not just for me, because I have a lot of people that depend on me. When I was diagnosed, um, you know, I may have heard from the, you know, thousands of patients from Lankanau that had, I had taken care of were worried about me. And then there were, thir we have 13 million unique users at breastcancer.org, we're number one in the world. And we had, a, we're flooded. And it, and it made me realize that, um, and I've got three kids, by the way, and a husband. And um, I realized, you know, it's not just a taking care of myself for me, it's really, you know, I've built a life where that's rich, enriched by having so many people I care about and care for, and so I have a responsibility to really do, to do it for other reasons. So um, I just, you know, I just, I try to keep grounded in, in all of that, and I do try to do the best I can, but I'm certainly not perfect. And I think that people can, you can think about all the people that depend on you, because I think that women have trouble with self-care, because we think everybody else should go before us, we should put our time and energy into taking care of other people, but the reality is the self-care comes back and take care of yourself, and then you'll be able to take care of any and all people who depend on you. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's, it starts with us, and we do, we are setting the example, mm -hmm. and um, our family is watching us, you know, our coworkers are watching us, and in today's world where it's so transparent between Facebook and all the ways that we lead our lives, people are watching us from all corners, so, you know, uh, I, I like to set the example and do the best that I can. Right, we all, I know that we've had a number of um, events where we talk about mentoring, and a lot of women in this room mentor younger women, and we think, and we are mentoring them in business, but we need to mentor and be leaders and show them how to live a healthy life. I just wanted to make an, ex an example of that. Yeah. So my 83-year-old mother was, uh, we, we were going to talk about, it, was, uh, yeah. was widowed. Uh, my parents have been married for 63 years. And she was having, you know, she was having all kinds of illness, whatever, and she was in and out of the hospital with various things. My father died of, and, of dementia, and she was on her own. And uh, she, I became concerned about her, because remember I was saying sharing your life is really important. And so I was trying to find ways for her to sort of share her life. So in my mentor role, I encouraged my mother to get out there and meet somebody else. So I helped prepare her profile for online dating. <laughs> she went on to J-Date, J-Date, Jewish dating, and met a 90-year-old guy, OK? She's 83. He's 90, right? Now, he lied about his profile. He said he was 89. <laughs> this is true. Because he didn't want to meet, miss the hot chicks that were in the 80 category. He thought if he was over 90. So fast forward, they're engaged. He, wait a minute. They're engaged. She's 86, and he's 93. And she's rediscovered her libido. <laughs> now, I, I'd have... She and she's setting a good, good example. Now that, of course, is important. But you know, we were thinking about inviting her on the stage. But I made her promise, like, don't be talking about that to 500 of my friends and new friends. And she's like, but I have to tell the world about it. I want to tell all women out there that you can, that your next relationship could give you a lot more than the other relationship. And it's like, I'll, I'll be sure to pass that on, mom. Okay. Uh, all right. Are you ready to do questions? Questions. Because so, all right. The news about, oh, the breast cancer screening at age 45 is shocking. Why? I would be dead, as would many friends. Um, and you all know what she's talking about, right? So the American Cancer Society just developed new guidelines for mammography with a goal of helping reduce the quote unquote harms of false positives, which means you, you, you take, check something out, it turns out to be a false alarm also to reduce the harm of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And they did a, had a committee that looked at a lot of the, the established data, which by definition is old data, and, and used that old data to create future recommendations. And they said that you should start getting your mammogram at age 45 every year until you're 55, and then after that you can go every other year. And they also are saying, that you can forget breast self-exam, breast self-exam, forget that for anybody. And for, for women at quote unquote average risk, you can forget clinical breast exam. Your doctor doesn't have to examine your breast. So 
this, it, this just came out on this past Tuesday at 11 a.m. The, the, the embargo was lifted on this. So we've been very busy, breastcancer.org and Lincoln are very busy at um, preserving a woman's right and the need, importance of getting mammograms starting at age 40 every year for women at average risk. And earlier, and with other tests, if you're at higher than average risk because maybe you've got a very strong family history or you've a known gene abnormality in the family, um, or maybe you had radiation to the chest as a young woman, whatever the risk factor is. Um, but the fact is, is that the problems with the recommendations are that they are made for women at quote unquote average risk. But women don't really understand risk very well. And ri risk is, is basically poorly understood and it's often underestimated. And in the category of women who think they're at average risk, there are a lot of women who are at higher than average risk. And it's also true that as we move through life, our risk goes up. And we don't we really systematically revisit the conversation of our risk with our doctors on a regular basis. And so we believe that, that every woman deserves her best chance at early detection. And that comes from the combination and the correlation, the thoughtful correlation between what your awareness of your own body through your own exam, your doctor's examination together with a mammogram, and to have a thoughtful um, conversation annually and maybe more often depending on your situation about your risk and what you can do to lower your risk. So, um, so that is, you know, we believe strongly that it is important to preserve the, to the access and the coverage of mammography starting at age 40. And if you want to tweet it out now, we have a hashtag that's 40 saves lives. The number 40 saves lives. And we're going to be working, probably we'll reach out to Komen, we're a friend of our organizations, to say to work together because they're on the same uh, platform as we. So um, we, you know, I just want to encourage you to get the best, um, uh, the best care possible and the best shot at early detection. And while the past there, uh, uh, you would consider a false positive a harm, um, I think most women in this room would say that with today's modern diagnostic tools, it's not a big procedure, and you would rather accept that harm rather than miss a diagnosis or have a delayed diagnosis because the, all the guidelines were based on, the, on survival and that being the only thing that really mattered. And I think if you asked everyone in this room what else matters to you, I would think that most of you would agree with me that I'd rather get diagnosed early when I can have less treatment and less aggressive treatment um, and uh, have my best chance at a full life view. So, hashtag 40 saves lives. Thank you. Thank you. In my two cents, the self exam, self exam, self exam, know your body and know what feels different, and don't wait. Don't just say, I had too much salt, or I'm a woman of a certain age. Right. It's easy to do. And it's frustrating because there's a lot of confusion out there. There's been a street fight for a long time about when you get a mammogram and when you don't. And if you ask the woman, average woman on the street who finds out you can wait till 45 and you don't have to have your doctor bother with a clinical exam, what is the message to her? The message to her is they've cured the breast cancer situation. It's not really a problem anymore. I'm off the hook. That might be one of her reactions. So people equate breast cancer risk with the start of mammograms. When the fact is, this is the truth, the fact is, is that breast cancer risk starts early in life and builds through your life. And there are very powerful papers for, that show that even at age 50, if you, if you change your lifestyle, get to a stick to a healthy weight, exercise regularly, stop smoking, drink alcohol and limit in moderate amount, limitations, eat a more healthier, healthy diet. And if you start at age 50, you can reduce your risk of getting breast cancer by about 50%. If we start with our daughters at age two, you can, she can, and you consistently try to lead the healthiest life possible, you can lower your, her risk of getting breast cancer by 70%. These are based on international data. And then next week, I'm very proud to say that um, a collaboration with um, LankanowBreastCancer.org, Mount Sinai, New York, um, Harvard, and uh, Washington University in St. Louis, we're publishing an international meta-analysis, which combining the whole world's data looking at the impact of breastfeeding on breast cancer risk by subtype. And it turns out that breastfeeding can reduce the risk of the most aggressive forms of breast cancer by up to 20%. So it's a, something you can do in a short term, breastfeeding with your kid, that has a very long term 
protection against breast cancer. It's better for the baby, better for the mom. And so for all of you here or for your daughters and daughter-in-laws, um, breastfeeding is protective. Feel free to tweet us some more questions at, M at hashtag MLTWOTM. Uh, let's see, uh, how did our, my viewers react when I announced that I had breast cancer? Um, you know, I almost didn't, I almost didn't share it. I, I waited till the last week of my radiation to share it. Because again, you know, the news isn't about me. I didn't want to put my, you know, I didn't think. And then one of my friends said, well, what if you share your story and, and tell people that it's because you caught it early. It's because you listened to your body. It's because, you know, I've been doing breast self exams for a long time. So I knew, you know, what was different about it. And, and I responded and I called my doctor and I went through all of the, um, what I needed to do. Um, the view, my viewers were great. My viewers were very supportive. And I, I was lucky enough, and I'm sure you have heard this over your entire 30-year career, but for me, you know, I, I had just started talking about it. So for me to hear from people who said, oh, I had blown off my mammogram for three years and I finally went and they found something, but I'm going to be okay then it was worth it for me to talk about. Right, right. Well, you know, thank you again for leading with your example because, you know, you are in the public eye. So many people see you or are inspired by you and we can share your message. So I, re I really appreciate that. And everyone here does too, I know. Oh, thanks. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Look how fun this is. I like this. Oh. How has my spirituality helped with your treatment and life moving forward? You would agree that when you see patients, right, that whatever their spiritual tradition sort of helps them because it, cal it calms them, has, gives them a good perspective mm -hmm. about it? Yeah, one of the most amazing things is, you know, I've been in practice for um, over 30 years now. And what's amazing is that there's only one of each person I take care of. There's no one size fits all. Everyone has their own unique story. And so one reason why I developed the, the, the full life view is that I started by asking a few questions and stopping and listening. Um, one is, is that, you know, how can I be most helpful to you today? And I also asked the question, where do you get your strength from? And a lot of people will go like this. So, and that's important for me to know because um, it's not about me. It's about the individual in front of me and for, for many people, you know, the, the words, you know, that God gives you the strength to carry on, God puts people in your path to help you, um, God helps those who help themselves, you know, that's, those are, that's a source of strength and motivation and meaning that, that can connect us together. Um, the fact that I'm an atheist or, you know, or not, you know that, that's irrelevant. You know, it's really all about each person. And it may be that someone takes this as an opportunity to, to, to become religious or become mindful or become more of a naturist, you know, go out and take walks or, you know, uh, figure, figure out ways to be spiritually engaged. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing is life has so many different chapters to it, many twists and turns, that you, you, know, you really need to um, uh, question your assumptions and how you see yourself can change over time. It's, that's what makes life exciting and spontaneous and you know, and so you can you can always create a lot of what is in front of you, um, new hobbies, new books to read, new people to connect with, um, and you know, redefining yourself, enjoying fashion, changing your fashion, <laughs> changing your hair, you know, taking a cooking class, getting a new job, getting volunteering, being a part of a board, being a volunteer. I mean, we have a lot of volunteers that made today possible. Thank you, but you know, you made a you made a. That's a contribution. So, um, and it, I know at the Mainline Health, we have volunteers that are essential to bringing patients to where they need to go, to helping patients feel better. Um, it's a big part of what's therapeutic. So there's so many different ways that you can make a, gr build a meaningful life. And it's a work in progress for each one of us. Yeah, for me, for me it was a, a totally a big chunk. And when I took sort of that immediate inventory after you hang up the phone, and say, all right, I have a lot to be grateful for. I live near world-class healthcare. I have insurance. Uh, I have faith and that and, and friends and support. Also a big part I know, you know, interacting with people mm -hmm. and having support. Um, but it's interesting, you know. I, I know Tara was saying I got the degree um, from the seminary and then a degree in spirituality and. Up until the point I got the phone call, I thought that was all because at some point I was going to do more speaking about 
you know, how God has worked in my life. Um, I, maybe now I think it's because I wanted to be super prepared and have a good foundation so that I knew it was coming and, uh, and I could journey through it calmly and with peace. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's very powerful, you know. Okay, one more question, okay. Does any history of family cancer put you at higher risk? Okay, so it's a very interesting, you know, question. But if you look at 100 women who, who were diagnosed with breast cancer, for example, 5 to 10% will have one of those single rare genes that produce a high risk like BRCA1 or 2. Then there's about 20, 25% of women who are diagnosed who probably have a, a combination of sort of weaker genes, which in combination produce a small to increased risk. But the risk that that goes along with could be between, let's say, 10 to 40%. But if you have a breast cancer gene, it's up to 87% risk of breast cancer. So, about, so overall, about 25% or so of people might have some genes running in the family that can influence the risk, but it's only 5 to 10% where it's really the main reason why that person might be at high risk for cancer. Then the fact is, though, that regardless if you inherit a gene, one gene or a bunch of genes, there's still a lot you can do to lower your risk. A lot. And women who, have the, who inherit a breast cancer gene absolutely have this, a chance for a full life view, but they might need to make some decisions along the way to substantially reduce their higher than average risk. And it's not just breast cancer in the family that you want to know about. You want to know about, first of all, from your mother's side and your father's side because it's, you're, you, you inherit these genes equally from both sides. You also want to know other problems in the family. Is there other types of cancers like pancreatic or melanoma or um, ovarian cancer, or any other cancer? Just share, share with your doctor what's going on in your family and update that information um, each time you see your doctor because that can alter your risk. Now you might think like this is scary stuff, the whole the breast cancer genetic stuff. But the way I look at it is, you know, when I have someone in front of me who I take care of who, who did inherit a breast cancer gene, I say, well, look, at least we can do something about this. If you came in my door, my office, and you sat down and you had a gene with, because, with, that has no sense of humor, I'd say that's an incurable problem. I, you're, I'm, if a person without a sense of humor, and there are a lot of people out there like that, that's, a, that's an incurable problem. It's unbearable to be with that person. So at least I can help the people lower the risk. And no matter what the situation, there's a lot you can do to lower your risk. Um, Think Pink, Live Green. There are programs going out there. I know next Wednesday evening, the 28th at Lankano, I am doing Think Pink, Live Green. And I'm going to specifically go over all the things that you can do in your everyday to lower your risk and hope for a full life view. And can I just plug all of your blogs, your, your Think Pink, Live Green, breastcancer.org. Please go to it. It has everything you need to know. It has the latest everything, but it also has your what you can do in the day to day. And it's really easy stuff. It's really easy stuff. And we can reduce our risk. Day -day. Absolutely. And we just so you know also that um, we just launched breasthealth.org too. So breasthealth.org is for women out there who've never had breast cancer, who who want to know what they can do in their everyday. It's a it's a it's a it also has a lot of information. So but depending on the audience, what you're looking for we have the, the information that will help, the practical information. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Tracy. Me. Thanks for sharing. Oh, yeah. We've been together for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to everybody here. Thank